Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining this webinar. Today, Ruth and I will be talking about when drug meets device and how to assess compatibility. As the title says, we're going to talk about a combination of drugs and devices. It is something that we're very passionate about and how to assess their compatibility is the main topic of today. But before we start with the co complete presentation, I want to focus on the fact that we will use different case studies throughout the presentation to demonstrate how we deal with drug device compatibility, but the cases are based, based on actual true stories that we have seen in our lab, but they're of course entirely fictional because we changed and altered some parts of it. So let's start. As I said, we're going to talk about drug and devices and when they meet, and we'll call this combined products. Unfortunately, there is no official definition for combined products, so we consider any possible combination of a drug and a device as a combined product. This term is broader than the um, defined combination product. This term is defined by the US legislation. On this slide, you can see several examples of devices that are meant to be used in combination with a drug. We can divide the combined products in drug-coated devices, for example, a drug-eluting stent. There are combination products, so for example, a pre-filled syringe or an auto-injector. And we also have drug delivery devices, for example, an infusion pump that's um, sold on the market to be used in combination with a drug. It's sold separately, but it will obviously only be used in combination with the device. So this is an example of a combined product that is not a combination product. The main focus of today's presentation will be on the combination products and the drug delivery devices. Yes, and these combinations of a drug or these combined products are very important and they must have a strong relationship. Like a marriage, a drug and a device, they must be compatible and form a strong union because of the benefit of the patient. What we want to avoid at all costs and at all timing is that this relationship will end in a divorce, that you end up with a bad drug or a bad device or that they're not compatible and that is, of course, not good for the patient. Any relationship that ends in a breakup has a certain reason and the main reason why relationships are broken or why it ends up in a divorce is because people or you assume something or you have expectations of your partner which is not there and assumptions are, of course, very dangerous. When you see something or expect something from the other partner that is not there, you will be disappointed. And that is the main reason why a good relationship can end up in a divorce. So assessing compatibility between a drug and a device at the beginning, at, at the first step, at the first encounter is crucial. And assessing this compatibility will decide further on whether, you will, whether this relationship will result in a strong marriage or whether you are going to break it up and avoid a divorce at the long term. So let's look at this marriage. And a marriage is a strong union. And like in every industry, drugs and devices, a strong union is also accompanied by good rules and regulation. So what are the rules for combined products? Well, to start with, devices and drugs in the past, they always have been separate worlds. You should look at it like devices coming from Mars and the drugs coming from Venus. And this also means that their regulations are very different. What can now be the rules for the combined products? Um, from the US side, we have uh, still some guidance from the FDA. And there, they clearly make a clear statement on the need for testing of stability and compatibility. This is also written in the European regulation. In the medical device regulation, you can see the requirement for testing compatibility. And that this is a very important aspect is emphasized by a recent um, EMA guideline on the quality requirements for drug device combinations. So it's clear that US and European regulations talk about compatibility, of, about suitability. But, but when you think about it, even philosophically, there is not just one test to assess the compatibility. Everybody, from their point of view, will think about a different aspect of compatibility. You will think about drug stability, microbiological compatibility, labeling, safety, biocompatibility, physical compatibility, and so on. 
Unfortunately, we cannot talk about all these aspects of compatibility, and today we're going to focus on three parts of, uh, of compatibility, which is the in-use stability, chemical compatibility, and we'll end up uh, by briefly discussing uh, biocompatibility. So now, Ruth, you can talk about drug stability. Yes, so what are the requirements for stability testing? Again, I'm making the reference here to the FDA guidance and the EMA guidance, where they do say us that testing the stability is necessary, but unfortunately, any guidance on how to do this is lacking. And this is what we will try to do in the next slides. We will try to explain how to perform stability testing for combined products. Yeah. I want to make clear that there is actually no guidance on how to do it. There is no textbook, no checkbox approach, and we will give some examples based on the, the case studies that we have seen in the lab over the last uh, five to six years. Exactly. And let's start with the most simple situation. That means there is one device that can only be combined with one possible drug. In use stability testing will be performed to demonstrate if the drug is the same before and after the contact with the device. And how will we do this? Well, we will compare the quality of the drug with and without contact with the device. I already used the word contact a couple of times, and this makes uh, this make I hope this makes you clear how important it is to select relevant contact conditions. You have to look at the uh, final real-life application. You need to consider the real clinical circumstances and then select the worst-case conditions. What parameters are included in the contact conditions? Well, we have temperature, we have humidity, um, there is the time range. So you start with the time point zero. What will be the end point of testing? Is it, for example, also relevant to include some intermediate time points? Of course, you will have to think about the concentration of the drug that you want to use and the diluents. Um, for a device such as a pump, a flow rate should be considered and so on. Something that's also very important to consider is uh, the number of replicates that you want to um, use in your stability testing. Yeah, and, and just for, for my understanding, Ruth, so if you're looking at a drug that is combined with a device is, I think, depending on the type of patient, uh, you have adults or children or the, the weight of a patient, you will use different concentrations of a drug. So what, what would be worst case, a high drug concentration or more low drug concentration? That's a very good question and unfortunately there is no, not just one answer. So both high and low concentrations um, can be relevant. A higher concentration, for example, um, can have quicker uh, physical effect on the properties of the device. But if there is some degradation or instability of the drug, a high concentration can mask this. And in that case, you are better, well, using a low concentration is more worst case. Low concentrations can also be challenging from an analytical point of view, so it's really making a balance between both yeah. sides. So if I understand correctly, with a high drug concentration, you're more challenging the material properties or the physical compatibility, whereas for a low concentration, you will easily see if there is an effect on the drug properties. Yes. That's so, a good summary, yes. Yeah, and ideally you have different time points, diff triplicate, singlicate, different conditions. Ideally, you should test everything. Yes, so yeah. we recommend testing in triplicate because from a yeah. statistical point of view, yeah. this makes more. So when, when we assume this, uh, like in every relationship, you have expectations, you want to test everything, you want to assess everything, and you have the expectations and you have the reality, like on this slide, there are limitations to what you can test, to what you can assess. There is a limitation from a pricing point of view, from a device availability and so on. So there are little, there is a there is a, a fine line between what you can do theoretically because you can theoretically test everything, but then you have the reality. And I want to show you this slide here where we have some devices. It's it's not very clear perhaps on the slide, but these are 30 different devices that deliver drugs, very small volumes, microliters, where we need to combine the volumes of 30 or 40 different devices to have 
one testing solution to assess compatibility. If you then want to test in triplicate and test different parameters, you can easily see that you will have a bottleneck at a certain point. So uh, sometimes people want everything, but you have to select the right conditions and the right worst case. Yes, it has to be feasible from a practical point of view also, of course. Now, once that you have established the contact conditions, then it's, you have to choose which tests you want to perform. It's very important that you select tests that are relevant to demonstrate the quality of the drug product. This can include a visual inspection, a measurement of the pH. We can um, assess the number of subvisible particles. Uh, we can use uh, chromatographic uh, technology to measure the concentration of drug, perhaps of degradation products, impurities, and excipients. There are a lot of choices to make, and it's really important to select the tests that are relevant for your drug product in your device. And can you, just a question, so if you think about drug stability, each drug is tested for stability when it's not in combination with the device, so can you not use the same parameters as for standard drug stability testing? Or should you use everything that's tested in there? You, release testing can be a very good base to select relevant tests, but you should not repeat the entire package of release testing uh, as performed on a drug product on the combined product. Yeah. And the specifications that you set, what are the criteria to evaluate whether the stability is fine or not? So to decide on, on the criteria, it's very important to consider the performance of your technique that you select. For example, if we use liquid chromatography with the UV detection, we have an idea about the variability of this technique. And when we consider this variability, we say that everything that is between 90 and 110 percent of the initial drug concentration is considered stable. So this means the initial concentration is 100 percent. If you have at a certain time point 90 percent left, we still consider this as to be stable. Okay, so it's more a relative stability that you're going to assess. Yes, compared so to the time point zero is very important because this is actually your starting yeah. value for the test. Yeah, okay. So as an example, these are two um, chromatograms that we use to measure the drug concentration. So on the top, you have the drug in contact with the device. And at the bottom, indicated by control, that is the drug without contact with the device. But of course, it is being stored under the same conditions as the stability sample. What we see here is the pattern is the same. The drug concentration has not changed. And this means the, control, the drug product and the device, they are stable together. And they can be used to hear the wedding bills read. This is another situation. Um, again, on top, you can see the stability sample, so the drug that has been in contact with the device, and at the bottom, the control sample, the drug not in contact with the device. Here you can see that the drug has disappeared. It's indicated by the red circle. It is not present anymore in the stability sample. There, might, there can be several reasons why this has happened. Um, for example, the drug might have been degraded by the contact with the device. It might have been absorbed onto the device. Or there has been some interaction with another compound. We do not know what exactly has happened. The only thing we know is that the drug quality has changed by the contact with the device. And in this context, this will lead for a breakup for this combined product. Okay, so you start with a, an easy marriage, an easy relationship, but when you think about marriage and, and relationships, there are many different types of marriages, relationships, and I think everybody, even you as an audience, when you're thinking about a marriage, everybody's thinking about a monogamous relationship. Yeah? Two people are getting married, but within the device and drug world, you, polygamy is perfectly allowable. A drug can marry different devices, and a device can marry different drugs. The importance of this polygamous relationship is that each individual marriage, so each drug device combination should be compatible, but this will add a lot, another level of complexity to our testing and to assess compatibility.
That's correct. So it's more complex, but it's more often the reality. So let's discuss one device that can be combined with multiple drugs. Again, you have to select contact conditions and testing conditions. And one can wonder, or should one repeat the one-on-one -on -one testing for each possible combination? This can be very costly and um, can, can take up a lot of time. So one thing that can be more efficient is um, to perform some kind of grouping. And then for a representative, perform representative testing for each group. For example, when you think about antibiotics, it's one group, but the chemical structures within this group can be very different. As you can see, I just put three structures here on these slides. There is a lot of structural variability. So for testing the compatibility of your device with antibiotics, it would make sense to select, for example, these three compounds as being representative for the entire group of antibiotics. Yeah, so the selection of your family grouping of the representatives of the group is very crucial and is not just based on the, let's say, the application like an antibiotic, but is more based on the chemical properties of a drug and perhaps also its excipients. Yes, so you can look at the chemical structure. Uh, stability might also be an aspect to consider. It is very important to make this selection carefully. Okay, so now um, it's time to have a look at some practical examples. As Lisa already told in the beginning, these, are base these examples are based on our real life experience with the testing um, of combined products. So we have an infusion set that we want to use with eight or more types of drugs. The first step would be to select representative drugs for each of the relevant uh, groups of drugs. Then you can select the contact conditions, which we uh, already uh, discussed on the previous slides. And then in the next step, you can select the test. So for this example, we have a chromatography test to determine the concentration of the drug. Um, this is a parenteral application, so testing for particles can be relevant here. And then uh, we also perform a pH measurement. And in this case, this is um, the medical device manufacturer also performed physical testing of the device, not only before the stability testing, but also after the stability testing, because the interaction of the drug with the device, it might change the physical aspect of the device. I think it was, it's very important to demonstrate here as well how physical compatibility and drug stability can be combined and, and can, can be hand in hand joined uh, during testing. Yeah. Okay, so as an example, um, testing for antibiotics, we selected amoxicillin um, as a representative antibiotic and we had a look at the content of the drug. On the left, you can see the reference sample or the control sample. So this is amoxicillin that has not been in contact with the device. On the right side, you can see the stability sample, so the drug that has been in contact with the device. The control sample and the stability sample, they have been stored under the same condition. So the only difference is basically the contact with the device. As you can see for the stability sample, there is a drop in the, um, in the drug content. So there is less amoxicillin detected in this sample. And we also see some additional peaks in the chromatogram. This indicates that there are extra compounds present in the stability sample that are not present in the control sample. So it seems there might have been some kind of degradation for this product. So the stability of this the, the stability of the amoxicillin in combination with the pump yeah. is maybe not the best here. So it means that if amoxicillin was selected as a representative for the group, the whole group is considered as incompatible from a stability point of view. That's the implication of selecting one drug as being representative no. for an entire group. Of yes. course, if you would test on another compound, then you can say for that drug product there is a compatibility. Yes, so this again demonstrates why it is very important to take your time to make the selection and to do it in a, in a way that's, that's, that's scientifically sound. 
another example is um, shown here. So um, here we have a table where you can see the recovery values. So this is, I explained it before, the criteria of 90 to 100 percent that we use to establish whether a drug is stable in combination with a device. Uh, several time points were tested for ceftazidim. Again, this is another antibiotic that has been selected as representative. And what we see here is after 24 hours, there is a drop to 35%. So this means at time point zero, this, the amount of drug at time point zero is considered to be 100%. After one day of storage at selected contact conditions, we only measure 35% of the drug. So this is considered not to be stable. This is actually a, a particular case because what we noticed is that the back pressure of the pump was also increased after 24 hours. So this indicates some kind of blockage. And it even went worse. We could not um, sample any more from the end of the device. So what we had to do after 24 hours, we had to cut the end of the device to make sure that we were still able to collect sample through the device for the following time points. And that's why the, the, the measurements at 48 hours, 72 hours, and 96 hours are indicated with an asterisk. They are actually, the sampling was not performed in the same way as for the first day. And this is, of course, it's clear that the drug and the device are not compatible because if there is no flow rate anymore, you don't, the drug cannot be delivered to the patient through the normal device use. But what we wanted to demonstrate for this case to our client is that the drug inside of the device is still stable, but it does it, it is blocked. It does not come out. So they also know the source, where is it blocked, so they can change the filter or change the design of the last part of the device. So sometimes that can also help. Uh, yeah. So this is a, a very clear example of a physical incompatibility, while the chemical stability was good. The next example is um, a measurement of subvisible particles. So again, at time point zero, after one and three days, uh, the subvisible particles in the drug collected from the device were measured. And what we see here is that after 72 hours, there was a significant increase in yeah. the number of particles. Yes, and the criteria that we put for subvisible particles is actually the same as in USP 788 for drug products. So it's a parental application. It is a drug product that you're going to deliver. And if you're above the criteria in the USP, we consider this as incompatibility, incompatible for from a subvisible particle point of view. So there are no true guidance on what are the specifications here, but we use the USP or the relevant uh, pharmacopoeial chapter as a guidance for the specification settings. So again, in this example, it appeared that one of the possible drugs that could be combined with the device was not compatible. And then you should not uh, propose to use this drug device combination. Something that's, that's often overlooked, but it's, it can be of importance, is to consider the state of the device. So for example, a new device or an end of shelf life device the physical properties, they can change. There might, for example, be some degradation of polymer material and so on. And this, of course, can also impact the interaction with the drug. To avoid misunderstanding, um, I just want to make sure that in-use stability testing cannot replace other required tests, such as extractable leachable uh, studies and degradation studies. Uh, it's of course possible that there is some extra additional information in your in use stability testing, but this cannot replace the other tests that are required for combined products. As an example, you're interested in the drug, but you also see a lot of other uh, peaks that can be degradants and so on. But this study, this in use stability study, cannot replace impurity profiling or degradation studies. Yeah, that's a very good point and, and often a misunderstanding for our customers and therefore this brings us the link to the second part of the compatibility that we want to discuss today and that is the chemical compatibility when you're going to deal 
with those things. Are there are the drug and the device compatible from a chemical point of view? What do we mean by that? When you look at this slide, you see a drug delivery devices, and we've made also a cross section of the device, even if it's labeled uh, in contact with the drug. And over time, components from the device will migrate into the drug solution. That is something that will happen. Polymer degradation products, antioxidants, everything that can be originating from the material can migrate into the drug. But because we're dealing with drug delivery devices with combined products, there is also a part of the device that is in direct contact with the patient. So you can, should consider that impurities from the material can migrate into the drug and into the patient through the drug or directly migrate from the device into the patient. Sometimes you have implantable drug delivery devices when, where there is direct contact of the, of the device sorry, with the patients, as you can see here in this animation. Now, it's very important, all these impurities, whether they come directly from the device into the patients or through the drug, you want to know two things. First of all, are they toxic for my health? That is, that is the main concern that you have as a patient. And second of all, do these impurities have an impact on my drug potency, on the stability of my drug? And to know and to assess which of these compounds do migrate or are coming, or are coming from the device and enter finally into me as a patient, you have to perform extractables and leachables testing. Now, as we started for drug stability as well uh, with all the guidance and regulations, here again we have the same situation. You have the fact that Drugs come from Venus, devices come from Mars, they use different standards to assess these impurities, these extractables and leachables. When you think about devices, you think about ISO 10993-18. When you think about drugs, you use USP chapters, PQRI recommendations. And although they want to assess the same type of compounds, their, the concern about safety towards the patients is the same, they speak somewhat a different language. Now, how to do this type of testing for drug device combination or combined products, you have to think about what is relevant and what is relevant and significant for your application. Don't stick only to the device way of doing it or to the drug way of performing these testing. You should consider a relevant testing. Now, I'm going to explain that more in depth. First of all, when we talk about extractables and leachables, to make sure that everybody's on the same page, what are extractables? Extractables are components that can come out from a device under extreme worst case simulating conditions. So we're going to select in the laboratory extraction solvents, extraction conditions. We're going to select an extraction ratio based also on the analytical evaluation threshold, which means that we're going to select certain conditions to make sure that we can detect and evaluate the safety of all possible impurities that can originate from the device. Now, how to select that? Because you have, as in my example, you have a part of the device that is in direct contact with the patient and with the drug. So in your laboratory setup, in the design of how to create an extract from your device, you have to take both of them into account. So you have to combine the ISO and the USP and the PQRI and, and, and combine that. So that's, that's very crucial. Whereas for another part of the, the device, it never comes directly in contact with the patient and you can actually base yourself on the more formal way to deal with it, looking at it from a more container closure type of approach. So that is a possibility and that is something that you need to consider. Of course, today we're not going to assess in detail how to do that, but it's something that I would give as a sort of advice. Think about it and select a relevant condition and justify why you have chosen these conditions. So that is very crucial. And then once you have chosen these conditions, you're going to analyze these extracts for different types of, of impurities that can come from your material. These are volatile organic compounds, semi-volatile organic compounds, non-volatile organic compounds, elemental impurities, anions, and so on. What you do for the organic compounds, you're going to use screening methodologies. You want to detect as much compounds as possible that can come out from your device. So you're not going to do a targeted approach. 
for elements, of course, you know which type of elemental impurities there are. So there you have a more targeted approach. So this is quite a fundamental difference between the type of testing that you use for extractable leachable testing of combined products and that you use for stability testing, which I explained previously. So in stability testing, you know at what parameter you're looking at. This is really a targeted testing. And extractable leachable testing is more a screening approach. Yeah, and also when you look at, uh, you, you made the example of LCUV, you see this is of the technology or the methodology is, that is mainly used in extractables and leachables, but also for extractables, you're using, looking at a variety of different compounds, and, and, and that is the main difference. So you will never be able to assess drug stability with an extractable study or vice versa. And that's a very important message and often a confusion of, of, uh, of our customers. Because in extractables, you basically, you do not know upfront what you will be looking at. No, that is always a surprise. A nice or a bad one, that is something we have to evaluate. Now, uh, just as an example, also what's very important when you do these extractable studies is that you test the complete device. That is also something from a medical device point of view. It makes sense from a pharma approach. There, there is more the uh, workaround to test the different components parts separately. And here you can see uh, the difference. So it's a chromatogram, but it's a mirror plot. So the bottom shows you the extractables profile of just the part of the device that has been that's in long contact with the drug, and then the top, the blue one, is actually the chromatogram of the whole device where we put in an organic solvent, and we actually use the flow rate and mimic more the clinical application. And you see there is a difference due to flow rate, different materials that are in contact, and you have to assess all these compounds because this is the way that you use that type of device. So very important, again, to test it and to use that flow rate. Now, of course, we know extractables are worst case condition. It's what can come out. It doesn't mean that it will come out of your material and what are, and that are the leachables. So the leachables are the compounds that do come out from your device in the patient and in the drug. And these are the ones that we're actually interested in from a drug safety point of view and from a drug stability point of view. The reason why you have to perform extractables upfront is because you need to know, from a leachable point of view, what you're looking at. You, you need to know what to assess into a drug product, and you need to know what, what to find, so under normal conditions. You will use the same technique, and you will combine the screening with a targeted approach, but you uh, have to know what comes from your device. That's very important. Now, theoretically, and that is something that uh, is often taught as well, that leachables are theoretically a subset of extractables. Uh, in extractables, you go worst case. In leachables, it's a normal condition. Now, if you think about, okay, I'm going to test worst case and everything is safe, why should I do leachable? First of all, this is a theory and it's an assumption. If you remember at the beginning when I talked about the marriage and the main reason for a divorce is making the wrong assumption or expecting something, that is actually wrong, we can be very much disappoint, disappointed and we don't want to have that disappointment. And that's because there is always, or there is a very high risk of having a gap between extractables and leachables because the fact that in an extractable study you use laboratory conditions with organic solvents and in a leachable study you're going to actually use the drug, there can be different components that will migrate from your device. You have to consider the flow rate, the drug concentration, the excipients, retained solutions, and the leachable profile will alter depending on the drug com composition. So in theory, for each type of drug that you combine with a certain device, if we think about our polygamous relationship, each type of drug should be tested for leachables. Of course, in practice, there is an expectation, there is a reality. You have to design your extractable study in such a way that you have captured that variability as much as possible and then select worst case conditions or certain family grouping, certain drug types to assess the leachable profile. So is it, is it correct to state that the selection of the contact conditions is more or less similar to the selection of the contact conditions for the in-use stability testing? 
at a leachable point, yes, then I would definitely recommend even to use the same conditions because, it, let's say, from a pharma point of view, extractables and leachables, the leachable study is actually very much aligned with the standard stability study. Mm -hmm. So an in-use leachable study and an in-use stability study should have uh, been assessed under the same conditions. So you can also make the link. I will come back to that later. But that is, that is very important that you think about it. And again, these can be a lot of different parameters as, as we've discussed before. So we had two questions when we talked about chemical compatibility. First of all, toxicity. Are these compounds potentially toxic, yes or no? What you need to do is, of course, when you're dealing with extractables and leachables, as I said before, the leachables are the compounds that actually enter into the body. So these are the ones that are of concern. And Normally, you have more extractables compared to leachables, as you see in this slide. You have a, a lot of different components coming from the extractable study, but you see now here six components are leaching into my product or potentially my patient. What we're going to do is we're going to assess the safety from a toxicological point of view. You can use in silico uh, QSAR methods. You can uh, evaluate it by a toxicologist using different guidelines like ISO 10993-17, ICHM7 for mutagenic impurities, and so on. And based on that evaluation, you will decide whether or not your drug and a device are chemical compatible, whether you will continue in the marriage or whether you will go for a breakup, a divorce. And that is a very crucial point. If it's not safe, I don't care, actually, to be honest, if the drug is stable, yes or no there is a potential harm to the patient, which is not good for the relationship. And if you think about the drug potency, how do we assess this? And I actually have given you the answer because the drug potency is the drug stability, is the in-use stability, which we have discussed. And if you design your leachable study and align this with your in-use stability study, if your in-use stability study is fine, your leachables are not toxic and they're safe, you can assume that there is also not a problem with the drug potency. So there are a lot of different aspects to compatibility, but they are also all connected in some way. So we already drug discussed the drug stability and the chemical compatibility, and now, Lisa, you will briefly talk about the biocompatibility part. Yes, very shortly uh, as a sort of uh, message. So what is biocompatibility? Biocompatibility is, as said in this slide, is about the material properties, the material function, and the interaction with the host. And it's typically for a device that we assess biocompatibility, is how the device interacts with the patient. Now, when you're thinking about the device, it's very clear and it's very straightforward. But what about devices that are used in combination with drugs? The question that I have is, can the material properties and the material function of the device be altered by the pharmaceutical drug product? Yes, I believe we already showed some examples that this is definitely possible. So, uh, for example, the degradation of the polymer material of a device because of the contact with the drug product. Um, another example can be blockage or narrowing of filters or other um, relevant parts of the device. So, yes, this is definitely yeah. a possibility. Yeah, and, and when you ask also different experts in the field, they will all agree upon that that is, of course, possible because you have a chemical interaction of your drug with the device. And the only suggestion or advice that I want to give is that you need to consider that when you're assessing the biocompatibility of a device. And we, when we think back to our relationship, we want to form a marriage. And when you think about before you start a marriage, you start dating and the way you behave during your first date or after a few years of marriage is different. And that difference is very important. And there is a change in both partners. And that should also be evaluated at the level of, compat of biocompatibility in this case. And that's often forgotten. This is also something that is written in the MDR. It, it says you have to test the safety of your device during the whole life cycle of the device. And the fact that your device is in contact with a drug is part of that life cycle and is part of a thing you should assess. And biocompatibility is one of these parameters. So as a take-home message, please don't forget that. Okay, so that brings us to our conclusion. 
Um, I hope it's clear for you that um, compatibility in all its aspects is of crucial importance for combined products. Incompatibility between a device and a drug can present a danger to the patient. Yeah, we assessed three different aspects of compatibility today, biocompatibility, drug stability, chemical compatibility, but there is more the, the physical compatibility and so on. So compatibility is not only a assessed to these three things that we've discussed today. It's a variety and it's always finding the balance between all these different aspects. And this will result in the fact, do you have a good combination? Do you have a good marriage between your drug and device? Or are you going to avoid a potential disaster? Are you going to have a breakup in the end? And that's the key message I think of today. And I would like to thank you as the audience for uh, your time today to listen. Uh, to this webinar, and I want to thank you, Ruth, for the hosting this webinar together with me. Uh, thank you as well, Lisa. My pleasure.